Hey everyone! A couple videos back, a quilt that I made, I hand stitched to quilt it. And in that video, I used a Yubinuki thimble, which is a Japanese style ring thimble. I made it a couple years back, and people were interested in how I did it, so here I am. I actually never finished the one that I made. I made two of them, and I didn't finish either of them. So it'll be nice today to actually finish one for once. So let's get started. So here are the two that I have that are unfinished. This thinner red one is my very first one that I made, and this wider white and blue one is the second one that I made. Even though I never finish these guys, I still use them when I'm hand sewing. I guess I don't really sew in a way where the normal metal thimble that sits at the end of your finger would help me out, so it was great when I found out about ring thimbles. They are more practical for me, and with these ones, you can make them super decorative if you want. So first, we need a ring mandrel. If you can find something that's the same size of your finger where you'd want the thimble to sit, you can skip this part. For the first ones that I ever made, I used, I think, a marker that was about the right size. But if you can't find something that's the right size, or if you want it to be super precise, you can make your own ring mandrel out of paper really easily. Measure your finger where you want the thimble to sit. I just used a piece of scrap paper. And mark it where the paper meets. I took another piece of paper, some more scrap, but much wider, and I marked the finger size on one end. You want it to be wide enough that you can roll it up a couple times so that there's a bit of strength to it. It doesn't need to be super long, that's why I have kind of this short piece of paper. And you also want it to be wide enough so that when you roll it up, it'll have a little bit of strength to it. You're not going to be doing anything crazy to this thing, but it is super annoying to deal with if it's like constantly collapsing and stuff. You're going to be rolling this up until the edge meets the mark. And to help me visualize, I drew arrows inside the finger width area at each corner, at the top and bottom of the edge and the mark, like so. Flip the paper over and then starting at the other end of the paper, start rolling it up. Err on the side of rolling too tightly because it's easier to let it out to make the marks match rather than trying to tighten it back up. When it's all matched up, secure it with tape. Now we'll make a pattern measurement marker guide thing. On a piece of paper, make a couple marks five millimeters apart. Really, you can do whatever measurement you want here. I've just found that five millimeters works the best. I made about 20 marks, and you can number these if you want. It's probably a good idea to do that from the start, really. I end up doing that at like the last thimble that I made, so yeah and set this aside. Take some cardstock or any kind of thick paper, really. This that I'm using is actually some thin cardboard that I had laying around. Mark how thick you want your thimble to be. I did one centimeter. The thick one that I made is about half an inch. So I feel like either of these or somewhere in between is kind of a good starting point. Mark this and then cut a strip. You want it to be long enough to wrap around the ring mandrel a couple times because making multiple layers of it will help strengthen it. The stuff that I'm using is actually kind of short, so I ended up cutting a couple strips and I taped those together so that it could make multiple passes around the ring mandrel. Cut a piece of bias tape a little longer than the size of your finger. If you don't have bias tape or you have a specific piece of fabric that you want to use for the inner lining, you can cut some of your own. Bias tape is just a strip of fabric that's cut at a 90 degree angle from the grain of the fabric. So here on my scrap piece of fabric, the grain is running up and down here. So I just eyeballed 90 degrees by folding the corner down like this. And then I used a ruler to mark along that diagonal line. So once you have that one mark, from that mark, you can just measure how thick you want your tape to be. I'd recommend you do the thimble width plus two centimeters. Here you'll see that I'm cutting it a bit thinner at 2 centimeters. I thought that 5 millimeters would be enough leeway on each side, but it ended up not. So I ended up having to cut another piece that was 3 centimeters. So I have 1 centimeter for the width of my thimble and then plus 2 is 3. Now to make the base. 
Cut the bias tape a couple centimeters longer than the size of the mandrel. Fold one edge in about 5 millimeters or so to the back and press it down. I just use my nail to crease it to make it stay down. And then starting at the folded edge, wrap around the mandrel, wrong side facing out. You want it to be overlapping about a centimeter or so, but if you have anything longer than that, you can trim that now. Wrap the cardstock strip around in the middle of the bias tape. You want it to overlap a couple times so the base will be strong, but still a little flexible. Also, try to make it so that it overlaps itself the same amount all over. So like, cut it at the same point that you started wrapping it, if that makes sense. Like I mentioned earlier, this initial piece of bias tape wasn't wide enough, so I ended up having to slide the ring base off, switch out the fabric, and then carefully slide it back on. But obviously, if you have a piece of bias tape that's big enough already, you can skip this part. And now, fold over the bias tape. You may have to use a needle or something like that to help you with this step. Take a needle and thread, knot the end, and then thread the needle under one side of the bias tape and out so that the knot will be hidden under the tape. And actually, looking back at this footage now, all of this is going to be hidden under the filler anyway, so I guess you don't really have to hide the knot right now, but whatever. From here, you want to do a herringbone stitch all the way around, pulling the bias tape taut. So to do a herringbone stitch, you bring the thread over to the other side of the tape, and with the needle, pick up a little bit of the fabric and pull through. Bring the thread over and down and pick up a bit of thread like before. Pull the thread through and repeat all the way around. I usually end up going around twice just to make sure that it's nice and pulled tight all over. Now, there's two ways to do this next step. I'll start with my least favorite way. Take some filler. I'm using some roving yarn that I pulled a small piece from and wrap it around the ring base. I've seen some people just use normal yarn for this, just wrapped around a couple times to give it the right shape. And this actually may be preferable for some people because it can be a little difficult or annoying to like tame the loose roving at first. And actually traditionally silk is used for this part, like loose silk roving I get, or what do you call it? I don't know, webbing? But that's more expensive and harder to come by for most people. So I just use yarn or string or roving. But anyway, you don't need too much of the filler, just enough to give it a little bit of shape. On this one, the amount I used was fine, but in the next one I'm going to show you, I kind of put too much, so it's a little chonky, which is fine, it still works, it functions as a thimble, but it's pretty bulky, so some people may find something like that to be more uncomfortable to use, but if you like that look and it's not annoying for you to wear, then by all means, make it as bulky as you want. Cut a strip of paper a couple millimeters less than the width of the ring base. Wrap this around the filler and mark the length. This is going to be what you draw the marks for the pattern on. I actually ended up switching to a thin piece of washi tape because I figured it would be easier to wrap around and stick onto the thimble base. Anyway, before that, I need to mark it. Take out the pattern measurement marker thing that we made earlier. Lay out this strip so that the top corner lines up with the first line and that the mark for the length of the thimble base is lined up with the number that you need plus one. So for this example, the pattern that I was going to do, I needed 16 marks, so I lined this up at the 17th mark. This is because this line and the very first line are basically the same once you wrap this thing up and stick it together. So essentially, one of these doesn't count. So I guess another way that you could do this is that you mark the very first mark 0 or something. So like 0, 1, 2, 3, blah, blah, blah. That actually probably makes more sense, but I just do the add one thing. Anyway, when it's lined up, make a small mark at the edge at each line, like so. Then readjust it so that the other side is lining up with the correct lines, and then mark that side too. And you should have something like this. Wrap this back around your thimble base and tape together. Take some more thread and do the herringbone stitch all the way around again to secure the filler and the pattern strip. You should try to keep your stitches away from the marks just so that you can more easily see them. Oh, and one thing that you can do also to help out is to draw arrows on this little piece of paper or tape or whatever you use to help keep you going the right direction when you're sewing the pattern on. So this is one popular way to do the base, but I'm not a fan of it because the pattern mark is far enough away from the bias tape, aka what you're going to be sewing through, 
and I find it to be just enough that it causes me to be less consistent with the spacing and stuff, which can end up being kind of a big deal with these things. So here's how I like to do these. And this is another popular way to do it. It's not like I just made up this method on my own or something. Instead of doing the strip for the pattern after the filler, you do it before. So measure around the base, mark the length, and then use the pattern measurement mark marker to mark the pattern. This scratched out bit at the end of my little strip is just where the paper is going to overlap. I just did that to help me visually so I didn't accidentally mark the wrong thing. So on this one I decided that I wanted to do 12 marks so when I was lining it up I lined it up to the 13th mark. And here's what I have. I taped this onto my ring base and then I added the filler which as I mentioned before I ended up adding a bit too much on this one. I mean, it's still usable, and actually I personally kind of like how chonky it ended up, but I would suggest not going this big initially, just because you don't know if you'll like it or not. And finally, do the herringbone stitch all the way around to secure it again. I much prefer this way of making the base because the pattern paper is right up against the bias tape, so it's a lot harder to mess up the spacing. A drawback though is that you can't draw the arrows to help you make sure you're going in the right direction. Though I feel like after you do a couple rounds, it's kind of easy to tell which way you should be going. Another thing that's kind of good practice to do that I don't do, and I always wish that I do, is add a red dot or some kind of color dot where you're going to begin the pattern. This will make it easier to tell when you've done a full rotation. And like I said, I don't do this. I always forget. And on this one, I actually end up messing up my count of how many passes I did with one of the colors. So the stripe is thinner than the other ones. And then the next stripe I had to make thicker. Yeah, I guess it's not too bad, but it's a glaring mistake for me. So I wish that I did the dot. You'll notice that on my base, all the marks are red. It's because I went back after I did the herringbone stitch. I didn't do like I said to do before, which was to not cover your marks with your herringbone stitch. Um, so I just wanted to remark it just so that I could make sure I could see them clearly. And I ended up using a red marker for that. So that's why I have red dots all over mine. This thimbles pattern is going to be these simple zigzag stripes. And for this, the pattern needs to have an even number, which is why I did 12. So I'm gonna be doing one super easy pattern, and then one that's kind of a little bit more difficult, but nothing like super duper crazy. But you can find patterns for these guys online. It's just kind of hard to read them sometimes, and a lot of them are in Japanese. So it might take a bit of trial and error to figure out uh, some of these patterns, but yeah. This one, I'm gonna do a simple zigzag stripe. And for this, you need to have an even number of marks, which is why I did 12. I'm using embroidery thread, the kind where it's like six threads twisted together. And I pulled these apart so that I could use one thread at a time. If you wanted, you could just use spools of thread so that you don't have to pull the embroidery thread apart, but it's cheaper to get a wide variety of colors if you use embroidery thread. So it's really whatever you wanna do. Starting with the color that you want at the base of the stripe, basically the one that's not going to be showing as much, thread through the filler and up to your first mark. The direction that I'm going to be sewing will be to the right, so pull the thread over to the opposite direction that you're sewing, so left for me, and thread the needle through the bias tape at the first mark and pull it through. Bring the thread down and over to the next mark, thread through the bias tape, and then pull through. Make sure that the thread is looping over itself like this. Continue this until you're one stitch away from a full rotation. To complete this, thread through the bias tape directly next to the first stitch so that the thread crosses over the beginning of the thread. So for me, since I'm sewing to the right, this stitch would sit directly to the right of the first stitch. For this pattern, you continue this for a couple more rotations I went around about seven times. When you finish with this thread, or you're at the end of the thread and need to get more, just stitch through the filler and back again to lock the thread in place. Make sure you know where you ended because that's where you're gonna be starting back up again. 
In the beginning, it's pretty easy to spot where you stopped because you can easily just count the thread. But once it gets further along, it's harder to keep track of. So I end up just using a pin and sticking it right where the last stitch is. But anyway, add more thread and pick up where you left off, beginning the stitching just like you did at the very start. So here's my base ready for the next color. I threaded this one on just like before and just continued around and around the same amount of times as I did for the first color. And then I repeated this for each color after that. So you can do however many colors you want. You could just do two colors if you want, um, or you can do a different color for each rotation. I went with five colors to make a rainbow, and my intention was to have them all be the same width, but like I mentioned before, I messed up my count on the yellow and it ended up being thinner than the rest, which then I had to make the pink a little thicker, and yeah, so that happened. I mean, I do still love how it turned out though. This is a fairly simple design because once you start, you just keep going around and around the same way. But since the initial ones that I showed you, the ones that I made a couple years ago, are more intricate looking, they have a scale pattern, I thought that I would show you guys how to do that. And actually, I end up doing one that's a little bit more intense, but it doesn't have to be, and I'll explain how to make it not as intense as we go along. So basically, you make the ring base like how you did previously, but when you do the pattern, you want an odd number of marks. So for this one that I'm doing, I did nine. So essentially you do the same steps as before, but since it's an odd number of marks, you'll notice that when you're coming up around to the beginning for the first time, you'll actually have to go around again because it doesn't line up until you make basically two rotations. So to keep it on the easier side, to make them look like what I did with my first ones, once you reach the beginning, you can just keep going around. If you want to use the same color, you can just keep going around and around until you want to switch colors, and then you just keep going like that. It's basically like doing the stripey one. It'll just start forming a scale pattern on its own. But of course, I'm doing one that's a little bit more difficult. I decided that I wanted to do two different base colors for the scales. So to do that, I basically had to make two starting points for each color. Since I wanted to alternate the colors, when I added the green, I eyeballed it and started in the middle between the pink stitches. Also, you can see here that I tried to keep the first thread out of the way by wrapping it around the needle and then sticking that in the thimble so that it would all stay right there. I thought that it would help keep the thread out of the way as I worked on the second color, but it actually was pretty annoying, so I wouldn't really recommend that. Later, I end up just laying the thread up and out of the way. Once you've reached the beginning of the second color, Pick up the first color and then continue around and repeat this alternating the colors as many times as you want. The design that I'm doing basically has a little dot of color at the base and then the rest of it is white and then a gray outline. So to get that I made three passes with each color. So like I did pink and then green and then pink and then green and then pink and then green. Alternating between these makes sure that the thread crosses over each other like so, so don't forget to do that. Again, if you're just doing it into each mark with the single color and not doing this crazy two color thing, it'll just kind of do that on its own as you go around so you don't have to like really worry about switching between anything. When I was ready for the white, I secured the thread and cut it off like before. I added the white and then continued stitching. I'm doing white for the majority of this, but since the thimble has two starting points, each starting point is basically its own thing. So I had to continue with the two needles, two thread, alternating between them after each rotation, even though I was doing the same color. If you don't, the thread won't cross over like it's supposed to and it's gonna look weird. Anyway, if you're doing the one color thing and not skipping over any marks as you go around, you don't have to bother with switching thread or anything. Like I said, you just keep going around and around as much as you want and you can switch colors easily just like the last pattern that we did. So like I said, the first one that I made was like that, 
I did switch colors, but only in the same way that I did for the first one that I showed you here. It was continuing on in the same section, so I didn't have to do any of the weird alternating. I just changed the color. For this, I was trying to make a gradient, so I started with a base of the tan, which I did a couple rotations of, and then I switched to red, which I did one rotation of, then back to the tan, which I did two, and then back to the red, which I did two, and then tan, I did one, and then red, I was going to do the rest of the way until it was finished, but I only did, I think, like two or three rotations, and then I stopped for some reason. And now I don't have this red thread, so this thing is going to go unfinished for the rest of time. So anyway, back to the one that I'm working on now. When I had enough of the white, I finished it off with the gray. I actually kind of liked it before I added the gray. I kind of wish that I did a lighter gray so the contrast wouldn't have been so intense. But actually, it's kind of growing on me now since I finished it and I don't dislike it as much. So there we go, Yubinuki Thimbles. I'm so excited to have finally finished one, but not just one, two, and I love how they turned out and I'm so excited to start using them. I hope you guys enjoyed today's video. If you did, please leave a like, subscribe, hit that notification bell, all of that good stuff. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you guys next time. Bye!